It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. We're joined today by Edward Baptist. He's a professor at Cornell University and recently published a very serious and uncomfortable work of American history that has received an absolutely extraordinary response. The title is The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. It is a history of antebellum slavery in the United States arguing that the enslavement of African people brought to North America in the two centuries prior to the Civil War was not just a great moral failure of American society in the South specifically, but was in fact the cornerstone for economic success throughout the United States in that century. That for decades and decades, slavery was central to the fortunes of generations of all white Americans in the North, South, and West regardless of whether they directly owned enslaved people or participated in the business of slavery. He suggests even that the very survival of the young American Republic created in 1776 was due to the nation's voracious and violent exploitation of enslaved people, and that without slavery, the United States would never have emerged as a world power. His depiction of the sadism employed to extract maximum levels of labor from enslaved people and a rampant tradition among Southern men, rich and poor, of repeated rape and sexual exploitation of black women will be a shock to the senses of any defender of the aristocratic Old South. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You've written a really uh, disturbing, in a lot of levels, book, and a very important one. Uh, Interestingly enough, it's not often that a very negative review of a book turns out to be the best thing that can happen to it. But arguably, <laughs> arguably that's what's happened with you. After your book came out, uh, it re received a very harsh review in The Economist magazine, uh, and that turned out to be an extraordinarily good thing. But your book is really about the inextricable connections between slavery and American capitalism and its industrial development. But in the end, what the book said, I mean, what the, re the review was, the economists withdrew it because of the public reaction uh, and reactions by scholars and, uh, and others, uh, experts on this, uh, and, and then apologized. I think the operative line uh, that, the, that was the problem was that slave owners surely had a vested interest in keeping their hands their workers ever fitter and stronger to pick more cotton, that they, uh, that they would protect them. And then he says, Mr. Baptist uh, has not written an objective history of slavery. Almost all of the blacks in his book are victims. Almost all of the whites are villains. This is not history, it is advocacy. The problem with the review, first of all, was that it was so ham-handed. Uh, it uh, was, was pretty dismissive of the testimony of uh, formerly enslaved African Americans uh, and suggested that uh, because of the uh, amount of profit uh, that, that was um, derived from the exploitation of enslaved people because of the way they represented wealth, that therefore, in fact, the, the sorts of tortures, uh, the sorts of um, assaults that survivors remembered and recalled and observers also uh, recalled, that, that these simply wouldn't have happened. Uh, and, and this was a, a blanket statement uh, that, that really uh, denied the veracity of what survivors had actually, had actually reported. So the review uh, offended a lot of people and seemed uninformed. But what do you say to the substance of that last line? Uh, I mean, there's a suggestion there that somehow it's impossible that virtually all of the black people in this story were victims and that virtually all of the white people were villains. Is that impossible? Well, I think, I think one of the interesting things that came out of the public discussion uh, that came in particular, particular on social media, where, of course, a, a whole hashtag was created, Economist Book Reviews, uh, was, was that uh, obviously um, enslavement victimizes the people who are its 
its victims, uh, enslaved people, and victimizes and exploits them. And, and so to suggest otherwise, as, as the, uh, the reviewers seem to be doing, was, was absurd on, on the face of it. But I want to say something about villains. I don't think my book argues that all white people were villains. I mean, there's, there are certainly villains in the book, and there are people who are particularly conscious about uh, what they're doing, uh, people who are particularly sadistic, as you suggested. And you'll find those in every human society. Uh, what, what, in fact, I think the book argues is, is that it was the system uh, that, um, uh, that created um, the ability for, for ordinary people to participate in these, in these uh, sadistic, um, what we would call sadistic uh, behaviors, and to see them as part of the normal course of business. And that, I think, uh, is, is something um, that's actually harder to face and harder to look at than, than a system in which we can identify some specific villains and say, okay, these people are the problem. It's the banality of, of the villainy, if you will, uh, that's, that's so significant. So let's talk about that, the, the, this, your fundamental premise the, uh, about the centrality of, of slavery to America's development as a nation. Uh, and, and what you're saying is that it was different than what has been generally understood. But, but what, do, what do you mean by that? So I, I think generally uh, we have seen, particularly in popular understandings of history, but even until very recently in many academic understandings of history, we've seen slavery as essentially a non-profitable system. And even where individual uh, owners uh, were, were able to um, extract profit uh, for whatever reason, uh, as a whole the system itself was unprofitable. It was not economically viable for the long term, and it was not a significant contributor to American economic growth. Because the shorthand of that was that, uh, and I certainly learned this as a, a little boy uh, in, in school in Mississippi uh, in the 1970s, was that the, the North was the place that was industrializing, and the North was the place that was becoming modern, and ultimately this was why they would win the Civil War, and the South was this kind of decaying uh, agricultural world, and probably slavery was going to uh, evaporate from the, from, the, from the face of the earth eventually, it was sort of winding down. People like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson uh, had been frustrated by the burdens of having to have all these slaves um, uh, uh, at the end of their lives. I mean, that was the picture that, that there was really no sense of connection between the Industrial Revolution uh, and the use of slaves in agriculture in the South. Yeah, and I think what I argue and what some other historians who are writing now uh, uh, also are arguing it is that Southern slavery in the 19th century is both modernizing, so it's, it's crucial to the overall development of the American economy, the American industrial economy, uh, and it's also modern. Uh, it's inherently like uh, the North in certain ways. Not exactly the same, they're not identical twins, uh, but, but they're very closely related. They, they share a strong family resemblance, particularly in the way that productivity gets more and more, uh, it increases over time. Slave labor becomes more and more efficient from 1800 to 1860, and particularly in the production of cotton, which is the most important commodity in the world market at that time. It's the, it's the oil of the first you know, 50, 60, 70 years of the Industrial Revolution. It occupies that kind of role in the global economy that petroleum <coughs> occupies today. And you, and you map out in the book how at the, at the time of the revolution and the first years of the republic that most of the enslaved people in North America, and leaving aside that there are actually larger numbers of African people being taken to the Caribbean and South America, but the, uh, nonetheless that's connected into some of this as well, but most of the enslaved people in America are in the mid-Atlantic. They're in Maryland and Virginia and the North Carolina, the tobacco plantation world of the founders, uh, right. of the, the plantation owning founders. But that as we get into the, the late 1700s and the beginning of the 19th century, uh, there are these vast territories to the west that are wilderness. And we, we forget that sometimes. We think that going west and into the wilderness uh, was going out to the, 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 the way out west, the wild, wild west. But really, it was going to South Carolina and Georgia and the interior of all these coastal states. And there was a great struggle over who was going to control all of this land. How was it going to be divided among people? Could it really even be settled? And it's this vast, vast wilderness. You say in the book somewhere, 65 million acres. That's Alabama and Mississippi. That essentially, except for right on the, right on the, where the water is uh, off the Gulf Coast, essentially no white people there until well into the 19th century. And suddenly this is open. And in this incredibly short period of time, this wilderness of giant trees and untilled soil, 
is made into something of an agricultural empire. So how, how does that happen? Well, that happens, first of all, because of government policy. I mean, the federal government puts its shoulder behind the wheel of taking this territory from other people who claim it, Native Americans, other European empires, uh, and handing it over to uh, its citizens, uh, who are also, in many cases, among its, its leaders, enslavers from the South in particular, although you know, there are plenty of Northerners who come down and, and become frontier entrepreneurs as well. So that's, that's uh, one thing that we can't lose track of, that there's a great deal of policy that happens in Washington and happens in state capitals that, that uh, is, is a big part of this process. But also, uh, it happens because enslavers are able to march hundreds of thousands of people, enslaved people from Virginia and Maryland and North Carolina and some other states as well, down to this territory uh, and drive them to work clearing it, planting it, and picking the cotton that, that comes, comes from that territory. And we finally can't forget the role of the world market in this. There's a world market for raw cotton. It demands more and more cotton. And enslavers are able, with, a, with their ability to continually increase the efficiency of production uh, through measured, calibrated torture, ultimately, they're able to underprice every other producer or set of producers of cotton in the world. And so the world market responds. They buy this cotton. Uh, they flood credit into the hands, into the pockets of these frontier entrepreneurs who then buy more slaves, which who cut down more trees and plant more cotton and so on. And that's how it happens so quickly. But it's really remarkable in human history for an agricultural frontier to be settled so quickly. And the people who have access to that are the ones who begin to accumulate wealth in ways that still have an effect on American society today. Right. And so the federal government is heavily involved in that business as well. At certain points in time, it also finances the settlers who are moving onto that land. It actually lends them money so that they can buy more and more land, settle it more and more rapidly. Yeah, so it's not just a bunch of brave guys heading right. out into the woods and carving out their piece of America and the American dream and being exceptional. It's not just that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a much more organized thing that is done by government and done by society, but it's the way that this frontier was so radically transformed so fast. But in the midst of all that, there are not enough free Americans to actually clear all that land mm -hmm. in the span of time that, that it happens. Mm -hmm. So in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson is elected president, how many enslaved people are there in America, roughly? Uh, roughly, there are about a million. Uh, there's about 800,000 at, at the end of the, uh, uh, the revolution. And actually, the, the international slave trade continues until 1807. And from about 1800 to 1807, as the cotton economy is increasingly booming, you see a big rush to import more enslaved people from Africa. And, and we have some dispute about exactly how many they bring in in, in that period, but it looks like it's between 100,000 and, and 200,000 more, just in that period alone, and primarily into South Carolina, actually, which is the epicenter at that point of the Cotton Revolution. But there's about a million, more or less, in, in 1800. But then over this period of time, from about then until uh, the 1830s, the 1840s, there is, you, you end up with, a, in the end, a larger number than that. But then at, at some point along the way over the course of this time, how many enslaved African Americans who have been in the Mid-Atlantic or in South Carolina end up being forcibly moved from the world of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington into this very different wilderness and this very different kind of slavery? Uh, more than a million. That's, that's our best estimate. Uh, we don't know how many more. Probably at least half of them were moved by slave traders, but more than a million overall are shifted. By 1860, there are about uh, 3.84 million enslaved people in the United States. And by that point, two million of them are living in the cotton country, roughly. Uh, and so uh, a million have become two million uh, by that point in time over, over the course of 60 years. Yeah, so you're talking about a massive dislocation of yeah. individuals. But what you describe in the book is then this million people who were sort of ripped out of that version of slavery and sent off into this wilderness from which no one ever comes back, no one ever is heard from again, for the most part by these families, and to a kind of brutality and mistreatment that is far beyond what was typically happening uh, it, when they had lived in these places back, back on the coast. Right, right. Well, what had happened over, over the course of the 1700s, of course, uh, was that as Africans uh, married each other, had kids, uh, as the kids became African-Americans uh, and grow up and raise their own families, uh, 
Uh, and as those families are sometimes split up by divisions at, at the time of inheritance, but usually don't move so far away from each other, we have this rich development of kinship networks, cultural ties, uh, institutions that might be invisible to white people, but which exist all the same. And that is repeatedly broken up in the, in the course of this migration that, that we're talking about here. I mean, one indication or, or one, one example just to, um, to try to make this a little more concrete, uh, I was able to, um, for 1829 to 1831, track every enslaved person who was sold to New Orleans. And this was the hub of the domestic slave trade in the Deep South. Uh, this, this was the epicenter of it. Uh, and, and out of those people, about a hundred of them uh, came from one county in Maryland, Kent County. And so I, I went back and, and I looked a little bit more closely at Kent County. Uh, and virtually all of these people, by the way, who were sold were between ages, let's say, 14 to, to 25. Uh, and I did a little bit of uh, back of the envelope uh, calculating, uh, poking around in the census, uh, a little bit more calculating after that. Uh, and. Um, Although it's, it's hard to, to be precise given the way the census worked in those days, uh, it, it looks like there were about 1,000 young people, uh, young enslaved people in Kent County between 14 and 25. In two years, 100 of them were sold. Hmm. In two years, uh, 100 people were taken out of families and extended families, people who are just coming into adulthood, people who, you know, uh, one can imagine the hopes their parents had for them, their younger siblings. Uh, et cetera, their friends, uh, and they're gone. They're gone. Uh, and most of them were scattered to different owners in Louisiana and Mississippi, and they have to go through their own process of figuring out who to sur how to survive, who to trust, whether or not they're going to be able to do the increasingly brutal kind of work that they have to do, whether they'll be able to build a family, whether they even want to build a family under those circumstances. In its own way, it's like a replication of the middle passage from Africa to the United States and to the Americas more generally. But it happened, you know, again, uh, it's, it's remembered uh, by these, these individuals, and then it happens to them in their own lifetime, this, this remembered event. Uh, how did that work, though? How did the domestic slave trade operate? So by the 1820s and 1830s, uh, it's evolved to the point where it looks like a very modern business. You've got uh, firms uh, who often have principals uh, operating on, on both ends of the pipeline, as it were, in the Upper South and in the Lower South. So for instance, the, uh, the Franklin Armfield and Ballard firm, which is probably the biggest one around 1830, uh, has one of, its, uh, one of its bases in um, Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, one of its bases in Richmond, and then also has a hub uh, down in New Orleans. And the people who worked at the offices in Richmond, uh, and in Washington and Alexandria would fan out to county courthouses uh, and they would uh, set up uh, advertisements on every post or put advertisements in the local paper that was one, cash paid uh, for Negroes, uh, and they would, they would typically have a grading system, a number one male, a number two male, et cetera, for which they would pay established prices. These were sort of the going prices. And they would collect people together uh, and hold them in what was a jail, essentially, uh, and then they would chain them, and they'd either march them on board a ship or they'd march them overland uh, to the south. And if you were operating out of a place that was a little closer to Mississippi like, uh, or to Alabama, like uh, Central North Carolina, you might be more likely to march them. If you were operating out of a major port, then you'd be more likely to put them on board a ship. The Franklin and, and Ballard firm actually owned its own ships, which traveled in regular rotation uh, to New Orleans, taking several thousand people a year down there. Down at the other end of the trade, uh, you would uh, see um, certain districts in, in New Orleans or uh, right outside of Natchez, there was a place called the Forks in the Road, which was basically a complex of jails. And if somebody wanted to buy an enslaved person or several enslaved people, they would travel there. Uh, and they would uh, inspect the people. Uh, they would line up their financing uh, they would usually work with one of the local banks. The local bank uh, would write essentially a check to, uh, to Isaac Franklin, uh, who would then send it back uh, up to, uh, to Philadelphia, one of these other sort of clearinghouses of the economy. The whole thing depended on a steady flow of credit, uh, which linked it very closely to the international economy. Uh, and, it, and it depended uh, on on these intermediaries, these slave traders who were a crucial part of the process. It sounds like the 
auto industry, yeah. you know, sort of new cars and how they're distributed and used car dealers going out and soliciting the purchase of used cars and right. selling with somebody else. I mean, it's that kind of thing. And, but all of that sounds a little uh, financial and clinical, mm -hmm. and that's not what it looked like on the ground. No, it didn't look like that on the ground. I mean, if you were a, a person who was actually going through this, you know, like uh, uh, Charles Ball, who's um, uh, sold in the slave trade from Maryland in 1805 and marched down to uh, South Carolina and, and then later uh, into Georgia, uh, it, was, it was a violent uh, and horrific um, experience, uh, particularly for young men, um, especially if they had something to fight for. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a great deal of danger at the moment of purchase for the whites who were involved. So what they, they, they were worried that, that this young man might fight back, so they would bring a bunch of guys with them, uh, and they would try to take uh, the individual who was being sold by surprise. The deal had been made somewhere else, but for instance, Charles Ball is sent uh, on a, a nice spring day to, to take a wagon down to a, a little village by his, his owner. Uh, he unloads the wagon, he turns around, he's surrounded by a, a group of guys who tie him up. And then you would be marched to where the coffle was being held, the group of, of people who are going to be marched down south uh, to South Carolina in Ball's case. And if you were a man in particular, you would be locked into the coffle. And typically this meant that you would be handcuffed uh, and there would be a chain uh, that was run uh, through, um, uh, through a ring and a collar, an iron collar around your neck, uh, and you'd be handcuffed. Uh, often to another individual, so there would be 15 or, or 20 pairs of men who would then be all on one chain and forced to march uh, sometimes 700 or 1,000 miles together. Women were less likely to be handcuffed, but, but sometimes were as well. Uh, and you can imagine being marched 700 miles for 50 days, chained to 49 other men. Um, this, is, this is a horrific uh, depressing, dispiriting kind of experience. Uh, and you can imagine uh, the things, um, both the brutalities that people may have inflicted on each other accidentally or intentionally, but you can also imagine the ways in which they tried to help each other survive uh, because uh, that was all they had uh, in, in that particularly horrific moment. And then at the end of that, you'd be put into another jail. You'd be um, given finally the opportunity to clean up uh, some new clothes uh, sometimes uh, you would eventually be paraded in a suit uh, with a nice stovepipe hat. Um, uh, but uh, before that, you would also be given the opportunity to eat because you would have lost a lot, a lot of weight in this process. So you'd be fed you know, with very rich foods for a couple of weeks, and then you'd be put on sale. But of course, these jails themselves uh, are horrible places. There are lots of people crowded together. Uh, if anybody's sick, everybody else is going to get sick too. Uh, there's the jail and then there's the showroom, right? So the process of going through all of that uh, was traumatic. And then the process of being um, bought by somebody else had its own kinds of traumas as well. It's, uh, and I mean, when you read the book, it's, um, uh, it's even more terrible. Um, I mean, the, the nitty gritty details as you describe them and as you try to go into the minds to some degree of the people who are having this happen to them and the, how th this wasn't just about physically restraining people and keeping them from running away or fighting, but, but a message really of, uh, of the necessity of submission. And by the time that 700 mile march is over, that something has been very clearly absorbed, that there is no escape from this, there's no escape from Georgia, there's no going back, don't think about it. But uh, at the same time, you, you have the continual attempt to get away. Uh, and of course, if you're marched 700 miles further into slavery, that does, in reality, make it virtually impossible. And there are probably only a few people every year who make it out of the cotton country into the states in the north, which are increasingly free states, or in some cases, they're able to hide on cotton ships and get to Liverpool or something like that. But the reason that we know what the, the experience was like is that some people did manage to do it. Lots of people tried again and again and again, sometimes repeatedly. We know this from runaway ads that were placed in southern newspapers. And some people finally made it, like Charles Ball himself, who actually escapes twice. Uh, but in the first escape, in about 1808, he crosses uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia uh, by night in the fall and winter, and finally gets back uh, to find his family is still alive. Uh, in Maryland. And that's an unusual experience, but it's significant as well because without a, that experience, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the testimony that 
that people like Ball go on to, to give. You know, some of them publish accounts, much like Solomon Northup did. But even more importantly than that, I think, is that the, uh, the abolitionist movement, as we understand it, certainly it, it just would not have happened. Uh, it would have been run um, by whites, for whites. It would have focused on uh, exporting free African Americans and maybe some enslaved African Americans from the United States. Uh, it would have been much more limited. But the testimony of fugitives who escape, uh, the testimony about what's really going on, how horrific the domestic slave trade is, how disruptive it is, uh, and how hypocritical it is in a country that calls itself Christian and is increasingly praising the sanctity of the family and so on. Uh, and finally, what's going on in the cotton fields of the South? All of this testimony converts a few really significant individuals uh, who join with black abolitionists to build this small but really important movement. And it just, it wouldn't have happened without the resistance of getting away and telling one's story. And you make the point very persuasively and mathematically of just how important the industry of slavery was to the North and how many jobs in the North and how many uh, economic interests in the North were also uh, as tied to slavery as the people who owned slaves in the South. And that is a really important point because of the, the classic understanding of that this was a bad thing in the South and that the North was separate from it. And you, you carry that over. But so that's the other half of the story. That, that's the title. The half that has never been told. That, that's, that's essentially it, right? Well, I think, I think the title works in a, in a number of different ways, but that's, that's one of the ways in, in which it works, uh, that the way in which uh, slavery helps the United States to modernize, maybe is even essential for its development as an economy, as a society, as a polity. So that's, that's one part of it. But the other part of it is what enslaved people do with their experience and the ways that they figure out to survive, how to survive, uh, the ways that they figure out uh, how to tell their story, first of all, most importantly, to themselves uh, and later to other people as well. That's another way to say, here's another half of the story. Well, it's obvious that this is a book that really challenges the classic Old South uh, lost cause sort of version of events that has been largely discredited, though surprising how often people still hew back to it. Um, but you clearly, this is a challenge to that version of history and even to the the, the improving version of, of that history that began to be written uh, in the first half of the 20th century. But it's also a shot across the bow of a lot of historians who are alive today. You know, you, the, you write uh, at one point in the introductions, the insistence that assertive resistance undermined enslavers power. You're talking about uh, historians who, who have focused in recent years on the agency of African Americans and the, the struggle, the individual struggles of African Americans and how the, 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 that assert, this idea that that uh, led some to believe that enslaved people actually managed to prevent whites from successfully exploiting their labor. Uh, and, and you challenge that. You say that the book is a challenge to that. You don't use the name, but I believe you're explicitly referring to, or at least implicitly referring to, to Stephen Hahn and you know, the book, A Nation Under Our Feet, that won the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 in the Bancroft Prize. I mean, I don't know that you really are specifically saying that, but you're challenging... <laughs> Uh, but if you are, let's have it out. Um, uh, <laughs> you're not just challenging a bunch of old fogey white Southern historians of 75 or 95 years ago. You're challenging a, a really significant body of what has been viewed as very contemporary, very modern, the most open-minded, maybe, history written about, about this period of time. Is, is that what you really mean to do? Well, I, I definitely don't think that I'm challenging Stephen Hahn. And, and in fact, I, I think that... Uh, and is in the book you're referring to, A Nation Under Our Feet, I, I think that his picture of the 1850s is what you would expect to see uh, if you um, believe that enslaved people who were forced into the cotton country, uh, who survived um, economic disruptions, who survived disease, who survived violence, uh, and, and found ways to build new networks each, with each other. I think that that's I mean, that's what I talk about in the book, uh, and I think that's what he describes at the beginning of his book. Uh, so, in, in fact, I see his book as pretty inspirational. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm, I definitely agree that it, the book is a challenge to historians uh, who uh, understate uh, the amount of violence uh, and white control that's inherent to the system of labor uh, 
that develops mm -hmm. in the Deep South, particularly cotton production. And I think historians uh, have not until very recent years talked nearly enough about how that system of production actually worked and the kinds of, it, of effects it had on enslaved people. We've been much less likely, ironically, to focus on cotton labor than we have on understanding 18th century tobacco labor, 18th century rice labor, and those kinds of things. And I'm not totally sure why, why we haven't looked at it. I mean, I could, I could make some guesses, um, but, but we haven't focused on that uh, sufficiently in the last 50 or 60 years of slavery historiography. Now, uh, I think my book attempts to do that. Walter Johnson has written a book that does that very, very well. Sven Beckert in his new History of Cotton talks about that as well, and there are other people who are doing that too. Is part of the explanation for that though, this, uh, this pattern that set in even after American historians began to, uh, to look more clinically and, uh, and at just how terrible slavery was or some of these aspects, but that even as that was happening, uh, in the, which really didn't begin until the 1940s and the 1950s, uh, but that so much of that history was, A, dominated by Southerners, uh, people like C. Van Woodward, who's not really writing so much about slavery, but the aftermath of slavery, but that but the practice of professional history is so dominated in the early years by white Southern men who are not that far removed from these events and related events to them. And there is an acceptance, even in that work oftentimes, uh, of that while Jim Crow South is terrible, but uh, an implicit, if, if not explicit sense that, well, but it was also sort of understandable. That's why some of those figures like Woodward at the end of his life uh, uh, become something of a right-wing reactionary. Is that part of the story as well, that even some of our heroic historians of a slightly earlier era were also still stuck in some patterns of, of assumptions that go back to the time you were writing about? Well, I think if, if Woodward sounded right-wing uh, towards the end of his life, I think it was mostly about student radicals and and you know people disrupting his classes. And you kind like of look that. like a student <laughs> radical. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, but yeah, if 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 um, if we uh, if, if we're going to run down Woodward here, I might I might get very radical. But um, he's he's one of my uh, my great uh, my great heroes in, in certain ways. It, you know, obviously not perfect, but but more broadly, I think you're you're on target. Um, absolutely, uh, that there was uh, a a significant impact, an impact that we're still um, finally clearing out the last vestiges of in certain ways um, by a significant impact made by the, the defenders of both the old and the new South in the historical profession. And many of them were indeed white Southern men. And that was, uh, that was obviously something, I mean, that's what Woodward is pushing back against in certain ways. Uh, but that's certainly something that made a massive um, impact on the historical profession. But I think even more broadly, uh, the long-standing assumption that slavery was unprofitable, you know, as a system, uh, that it was inefficient as a system, is is deeply embedded uh, in the account that we all have, uh, whether we're historians or, or others, of of capitalism and what makes capitalism work. Uh, we want to believe that it's about free choice, it's about wage labor that we choose or others choose to perform. Uh, and so Adam Smith and Karl Marx both, I mean, they didn't agree on much, but they both agreed that free wage factory labor was more efficient than slavery. Uh, but in fact, uh, it appears that cotton slavery shared a lot of characteristics uh, with wage labor in terms of the efficiency and in terms of its um, uh, adaptability to innovation. Uh, and this, this works in all, all kinds of ways. Uh, but most centrally in the way that enslavers use measurement uh, and torture to increase the number of pounds of cotton that enslaved people picked every day, uh, increasing it four times over from 1800 to 1860. And that's absolutely crucial to our modern world. And we've, I think, put a lot of effort into obscuring uh, that, that centrality. Well, you, you mentioned Northrop Solomon a minute ago, the author of one of these other slave narratives, uh, uh, and that, of course, was the basis of the, the film, 12 Years a Slave, and what you're describing right now is uh, one of the most powerful scenes in the film. Uh, there are a series of them, but that relate to, at the end of the day, or the beginning of the day, uh, the accounting of all, all of the slaves are brought into a barn, and the overseer goes, goes through how, much, how many pounds of cotton they picked the day before, and that's, that's in every single slave narrative, ex-slave narrative um, that's, that's published in the 19th century. Uh, 
that comes from, uh, that, that's written by people who were in the cotton south as opposed to the tobacco south. It happens again and, and again and again, and it, we see the white observers recording it. We have all of these um, thousands and thousands of pages of, uh, of ledger sheets in planters' records where, you know, they've got Solomon, you know, Tuesday the 2nd, 57 pounds, over and over again, and historians simply didn't talk about it into, until very, very recently. I was, I was really excited uh, in a certain way to see that come out in 12 Years a Slave because uh, from my perspective, uh, that was the best historical depiction of that absolutely crucial moment, which and happened let, every day. And let's not leave yeah. out what the consequences were, that if you right. hadn't picked as much or you didn't pick the amount you were supposed to, what happened to these people? Right, and so again, as the film depicts and as we read again and again in these kind of narratives, those who came up short of their quota would be whipped. And what's also, I think, really very well depicted uh, in the film uh, is the way in which different people have different quotas. There's a different understanding for each person of what their current maximum is. And there's a constant process of slowly pushing everybody's potential maximum upward. But, but this was the way in which enslavers were able to extract greater and greater efficiency out of every laborer, potentially, and over get time. Them, and get themselves into this very, uh, really twistedly cruel kind of balancing act between, uh, as I think you describe it and as that film captures and other things, of that, that using these incredibly brutal practices, and you talk about waterboarding and torture and, the, uh, and I mean, this, this whole array of, uh, of physical infliction uh, on folks to make them work harder, but this balancing act between how do you hurt people enough to make them produce more and more and more day after day after day, month after month, but not kill them. Right. Taking people right to the edge of physical endurance because you don't want to you don't want to actually kill this incredibly valuable asset. That, that for me, is one of the most perverse dimensions of all this. And we, we know that when people, um, let's say, activate that side of themselves, uh, the side uh, where, where one is being incredibly physically cruel, uh, they can get carried away. And in this case, uh, one of the complex emotions uh, could be sadism uh, or could be uh, other, other kinds of things that we don't necessarily think of as rational behaviors, but they were also part of the system and they were part of the daily life that enslaved people uh, had to calculate about, had to um, try to avoid, had to try to survive. And my sense is that the deeper and deeper you get into the wilderness and the more isolated these places are and the further from civilization and the, the perhaps ameliora ameliorating influence of just other eyeballs around, that things get worse and worse. I know when you get to the Mississippi Delta, where I happen to grow up, that the plantations of the Mississippi Delta in the 1850s, when you go through the plantation records there, the, the scale of brutality, even the way that those plantations were designed with no particular interest in having women or children around, the procreation of slaves isn't part of the business, and the conditions are so harsh uh, that there are these calculations in the ledgers of that if we can get five years out of a slave before they die in the fields, that's a sufficient return on investment. Investment. It's a astonishingly cruel. Yeah. I mean, there's an example in the book, Paul Cameron. In about 1854, he buys some land in the Mississippi Delta, maybe about uh, 30, 40 miles outside of Memphis on the Mississippi side of the, the state line. And there he sets a succession of incredibly cruel men to work on the 50 or 60, uh, almost all uh, between 15 and 25. There's constant violence. Uh, there are fights in the field between overseers and male slaves, and the overseers, you know, always have lots of weapons, so they end up winning the fights. There are lots of runaways. Uh, their overseer um, reports about one habitual runaway. Well, unfortunately, the agent uh, from, from Memphis, which was where Nathan Bedford Forrest was a, a slave trader, um, says we can't sell him because his back is too badly marked from the whip. So I think you're right that, that the further uh, out they got and the deeper into the woods, um, the crueler um, they, uh, things became. You also write about, and this is unpleasant stuff to get into, but uh, you write more explicitly, I think, than most, most accounts of slavery have been about the sexual exploitation of women. Now, when I was a kid and 
you go on a tour of an antebellum house somewhere in the Mississippi Valley, uh, there'd usually be no reference to, uh, to physical relations between the owners or white people and the slaves, but sometimes there, the tour guide would cast off some, uh, some playful reference to uh, the part of the plantation where sometimes the, the young men of the plantation or the sons of the owner, sometimes they would end up, end up down in the quarters and that's how a light-skinned baby would come to pass. And there was, there was something kind of, uh, kind of humorous about it and it was this, this modest little thing that had to do with when young men got too drunk and went to excess on a Saturday night. You talk about, you quote someone, rape, uh, the rape of a particular uh, black woman after she's been purchased, as is the common practice. Uh, you say slavery's frontier was a white man's sexual playground. Yeah, those are um, strong statements, but I also think that they, um, they're true. Uh, I, was, um, I was certainly su surprised when I started to discover in the papers of um, Rice Ballard, who starts off as one of the, the country's great slave traders and eventually becomes one of the country's great plantation owners by the 1850s. Uh, the operations he owns are, are producing 10,000 bales of cotton a year. I was surprised to find, to discover uh, the great degree of frankness with which he and his business partners wrote about enslaved women uh, and, and particularly the, the light-skinned ones who were um, sold as, as a, a kind of um, symbol of, of uh, sexual prowess, if you will, uh, marketed as such in, in, in certain ways. I was su su surprised by the degree of frankness to which they, they talked about all of that and talked about their own um, escapades uh, uh, and assaults, uh, sexual assaults on women, uh, and just the way in which they accepted this as, as part of the um, the attraction, the, the, the frills uh, of the trade, uh, the ways in which commodities um, who were human beings were marketed as sexual commodities. Uh, and and this, this was certainly um, one of the, um, the most uh, depressing parts of the research, uh, as, as you can imagine. But I, I think it's also, it's also something um, that uh, is, is quite significant uh, to understand uh, that, that the way uh, in which uh, American culture in general is, is often described as um, sexualizing uh, African-American women uh, in, in particular ways and in the ways that, uh, that African-American women are, are displayed, um, that, that this has very deep roots. Uh, and, and that's not just something that, that people say. There are some uh, very clear pieces of evidence uh, in the 19th century of the ways in which the domestic slave trade worked actively uh, to exploit um, that, that sexualization of women, to, um, to put it out there and then to make profit from it, uh, as it were. It's, it's really interesting. You can statistically um, map out data about um, men and women who are sold in the New Orleans market, uh, and you can find that there's a really clear relationship for men between height and price. The taller they were for a given age, the higher their price was likely to be. But there's no relationship like that for women. Uh, and it's hard to figure out from the data, that we, the pure data that we have, what made price go up or down. On the other hand, when you read what slave traders are writing, uh, they constantly write about men's height and perceived robustness and so on. And they write about women's physical attractiveness in their eyes of course. So I suspect that this was a part of the price as well. It's a disturbing thing and it sure flies against the face of uh, any of the softer interpretations of, uh, of, uh, of the story as it's been told. You had a real challenge in trying to humanize and give dimensionality to, the, to these victims uh, because while you have Charles Ball and you have Northrop Solomon and you have a, a relatively small number of other autobiographical accounts from enslaved people at that time and then you have the WPA narratives that are done long after slavery but with surviving slaves in the 1930s. But on the whole, even though that's a fairly substantial body of material, it's still nothing compared to how many individuals uh, experience these, these events. And so you very clearly, you say it in your introduction, that, uh, that, that you're trying to do more than, uh, than just a historical accounting of all this, but to tell this story, to tell this drama, this narrative. And, and so to do that, you had to, uh, I take it, and some of, the, some of the other criticism, even from people who really like the book, uh, is in this area, uh, but you kind of uh, 
you gave yourself permission to push the boundaries a little bit. And in the footnotes, the very first, the first footnote in the first chapter, you sort of confess this, mm -hmm. that you're going to weave together some accounts and use similar experiences. And, and there are places where you say something must have happened or would have happened or a thought that a person probably would have had, that you use some of those right. sorts of things. Um, that's a, that's a, if that had been in your PhD dissertation, I think that your advisor probably would have uh, challenged you on those constructions. Uh, but so what was the rationale for doing that? Well, I think actually some of, some similar techniques are in my PhD dissertation. And were they challenged? Uh, no, I, I okay. mean, my, my advisor pushed me to gather as much evidence as possible and provide the best possible interpretation, argue for that interpretation. Uh, and try to communicate it in the um, most effective possible language. And I think that that's what we do as historians. Uh, let's go back to C. Van Woodward, who wrote a great piece, actually, on the WPA narratives about 40 years ago. And he said to some of the people who complained that, well, these, uh, these narratives are interviews done with very old people remembering things that happened a long time ago. Or these narratives are, are done, uh, often they were carried out by white interviewers uh, who had a great deal of power in the Jim Crow South uh, and uh, very poor um, African-American interviewees who did not have a lot of power. And so this, this might skew uh, the results. And Woodward said, this just makes them historical sources. Historical sources are complicated. You know, people remember things and sometimes they misremember things or different people remember the same event from a different perspective. Uh, we've got uh, millions of words from, from Thomas Jefferson, I think probably millions. Uh, and um, every one of those words is a performance, right? That doesn't make, make them true, it doesn't make them false. Uh, we have to interpret historical sources to the best possible extent, uh, given the sources we have. So when I tried to understand what was happening in a WPA narrative, what was the message that uh, the interview was really trying, interviewee was really trying to communicate, uh, I thought about the other WPA narratives that I'd read. Um, were they using similar constructions of, you know, of speech, uh, ways of telling the story? Um, how could I interpret um, those words and this one in the light of what was said in other ones. Uh, when I thought about what somebody might be thinking when they stood up on the auction block to be sold, I might not have known what Rachel or William were, were thinking. Uh, they disappeared into the cotton country and we don't know what happened to them. Um, but some people did survive to tell their tales. Uh, and it's hard for me to imagine uh, that what they said, uh, what they put down on the page, um, was so different from what Rachel, Rachel or William uh, might have thought. So I try to contextualize things. Uh, I try to understand them in as rich a way as possible. Uh, and above all, to put um, formerly enslaved people, um, the enslaved protagonists uh, themselves of the story, to put them at the center of the story again and again and again. The idea that the official record, that the, that the white man's version of events that survived because he was the one with resources and, and position and because his life lasted a lot longer and he had descendants who knew who he was, uh, the idea that that record becomes the record and that we can only tell what is in that record unless there is an equally uh, concrete refutation of it. I mean, that's a, for a historian to, to follow that uh, to its end is to participate in the conspiracy that silenced all these people a long time ago. And so I, uh, I, I think that's exactly right. Two big ideas that we've, that we've touched on. Uh, that are mythologies around slavery. And, and one is this notion that it was dying out and that actually wasn't all that important to the economy. And the other canard from those days that's related to that uh, is that the Civil War really wasn't about slavery. So last night I was thinking about this and I, I pulled up the South Carolina, not the original ordinance of secession, but the explanation of why they were seceding. And uh, that's about three pages long and about a third of it is all about how the reason they have to secede is because the North is going to eliminate slavery. The other thing I pulled out, I don't think you cite this anywhere. This is a bad reflection on my reading interests. Um, uh, but this is a, a, there was a publication out of New York, uh, published in the 1860s, called The Old Guard, uh, by a uh, pro-Confederate New Yorker. And, uh, and this is from the, the October 1865 edition of The Old Guard. Uh, so the war is over, but he says, three billions of property in slaves was held by perhaps 600,000 slaveholders uh, who were denounced as a slaveocracy, but the North has converted these three billion of slave property into United States bonds, and by now 100,000 people. 
Uh, its production gave us more than two-thirds of the revenue of the country. It produced more than two-thirds of the export wealth. It employed more than two-thirds of the capital of the North. It employed three-quarters of the laborers of the North. It gave higher wages to labor, made living cheap. It poured a tide of plenty over the land. It goes on and on and on about the four million Negroes. And so it was explicit at the time. You know, people actually understood. That was an argument in defense of slavery after the war, immediately after the war is over. And so how does it come to pass that it's 150 years later that we have to circle back around to the idea that slavery was so central to American life and was at the core of the greatest conflict that, that shaped American history? How did that happen? Well, uh, that's October 1865, right? So April 1865, Abraham Lincoln gives a certain speech, the second inaugural. Uh, and he doesn't make exactly the same argument, uh, but, but he acknowledges the centrality of slavery to the uh, conflict that's just wrapping up. He says, if we have to fight this war until uh, everything that was gained, uh, all the, the millions of dollars from the 400 years of, uh, 250 years of unrequited, the bond, bondsman's unrequited toil, then, then so be it. That's, God can have, we can have no quarrel with God if, if that's so mandated. Uh, and shortly after that, um, he builds on something that he says in the second inaugural and uh, in another speech to argue for citizenship uh, for, for African Americans, uh, for, uh, um, in particular for soldiers. And that's essentially when Booth decides to shoot him. Um, and, and I bring this up because uh, what happens after the, over the next 30 years is, is a, a national struggle, a national debate about whether or not uh, African Americans are going to be able to exercise citizenship rights. And by the 1890s, whites in the North uh, and whites in the South, uh, over the vehement objections of African Americans, uh, have decided that they're going to they're join forces again. Uh, and they're going to um, keep African Americans uh, from exercising full citizenship rights, particularly in the South, but also in the North. Uh, there are quite a few um, uh, black neighborhoods of towns in Indiana and Ohio and so on that get burned out and people get chased away and everything. Uh, so uh, you've got to justify that, right? So you have to create a new history. Uh, you have to create a history that's not the history uh, that that author tells. It's not the history that Abraham Lincoln told. And it's certainly not the history that survivors of slavery told and continue to tell. But the official version of history in which slavery uh, was this, this sort of exception, this accident in which the Civil War uh, was fought over some obscure policy disagreements about the tariff or the interpretation of the Constitution, that's the point when it gets amplified, when it gets written down uh, in, in the, the boldest possible ink uh, on the historical record. That's when entire schools of history are developed to guard that interpretation. In fact, you can say American professional history develops at that time and for that purpose, right, to tell that particular story. Uh, but that's the part that historians played, and they played that for a long time. Uh, and papering over the things that were obvious, I think, in 1865. You just said the words reparations a minute ago. What does all of this add up to in the present? Is there still some balancing of the books that ought to be done or that could be done? In this country, we've inherited a vast number of assets um, from the past of slavery. Uh, and this is true whether you live in the North or the South, whether your ancestors were here in 1865 or 1861 or whether they weren't. And it's even true in some ways whether you're white or black, you know, we're all or, or anybody else. We're, we're living in part uh, on the, the capital that was initially deposited by this, by this labor. But of course, different people have very different access to that, uh, uh, to that capital, to that wealth. Uh, and, and we know that some of those divisions fall along race lines. Um, we know that um, today uh, the average white household has, I think, 13 times the wealth of the average African American household. Um, these are these are simply the facts, and there are many reasons for them. But certainly, some of them go back into 1861 and before, uh, and those. Divisions have been maintained sometimes by government policy ever since, uh, and other historians uh, and writers have demonstrated in writing about the ways in which government policy, even since 1865, uh, has um, had a, a massive net, uh, massive effect of a, a, a net transfer of wealth from African Americans to, to white Americans in particular.
Uh, this isn't something that we talk about in our public discourse either so much. But, but I think whatever the way to, um, uh, to deal with that uh, and to try to uh, create a, a country in which in a generation or two uh, the disparity is not 13 to 1, um, whatever effect um, that, or, or whatever policy or set of policies that we, uh, we choose, and I, I hope we'll, um, we'll face this problem in, in some way, I think it has to begin with a historical reckoning. That's something that um, I think as a country, particularly um, white Americans, um, uh, have really resisted facing uh, in, in certain ways um, over time. And again, as I said, um, I don't exempt historians from that. Uh, we've, we've been too often complicit in that. But it, it begins with, with really looking uh, at the history. And it begins, I think, with, with all, um, all readers, all Americans, all people who are interested in history, trying to see that history before 1861 um, from the perspective of enslaved people. Putting enslaved people at the center of this story, I think, is uh, absolutely crucial for the emotive part of that to actually happen. Well, you've made a great contribution to a conversation that we absolutely have to have. Thank you for Thank being you. here. The book is The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism by Edward Baptist. For more about this program and other episodes, visit us at millercenter.org, American Forum. See you next time.